Good morning. I'm Dottie. I am Barry's wife, and I am the children's church teacher here at the Knoxville Christian Center. The star of the story today is the Good Samaritan. And we read in Luke chapter 10 that a lawyer questioned Jesus about law, about the Ten Commandments, about eternal life. And um, I feel, as a children's church teacher, I feel that it's very important for kids to know the Ten Commandments. You know, the basic Ten Commandments, thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal, thou shall not commit adultery, honor your father and your mother. These are very important for kids to know. So I go over it about twice in a year. Um, at the end of every class, we play a game. And if the child can answer correctly the question about the lesson for the day, they get to throw bean bags into a cornhole. Kids love this game, but it's actually a review of the story, but we won't tell people that. But anyway, um, several years ago, uh, one of the youngest students in the class, she was only six, uh, she wanted to play this game. And the, the lesson of the day was the Ten Commandments. So I said, for a thousand points, name one of the Ten Commandments. Her answer was, thou shall not admit adultery. <laughs> she got the thousand points. We gave her a thousand points. But, but the lawyer was asking Jesus about the Ten Commandments. And Jesus said, well, what do you think? How, how, what do you say? And the lawyer said, well... Thou shalt love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And, of course, that covers the first four commandments. And then for the other six commandments, the lawyer said, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, that's very good. Well put. But then the lawyer said, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who is your neighbor? And so Jesus gave a great answer about the good Samaritan. Jesus said there was a Jewish man going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell victim to a band of thieves that robbed him of everything, even his coat, beat him up, and left him for half dead on the road. In a little while, a Jewish priest walked down the road, saw him, but passed on by. Then a Levite came down the road. A Levite, I had to ask Barry, is a man who works in the temple training to be a priest. He also saw this beaten up man, but passed by. But then the good Samaritan came along. He was good because he helped this man. He poured oil and wine on his wounds and bound him up. He put him on his own donkey and took him to the nearest holiday inn and paid for his stay so he could recover. And he even said to the innkeeper, if this man has to stay longer than what I've paid for, when I come back through, I will pay the difference. He was a good Samaritan. And Jesus said to this lawyer, so of those three men, who was the neighbor? And of course, the answer is the good Samaritan. Well, the question is, who is your neighbor? Is it your friends? Is it only the people who look like you? Who is your neighbor? Let's pray. Now, God, we thank you for this story that Jesus told about the Good Samaritan. And God, I think we all want to be like that Samaritan and love people and help people that need help. So, Lord, help us to do this. Help us on our walk with you every day. And, God, we ask again that you protect us from any danger and you protect us from any sickness. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now I'd like to introduce a man who loves God and he loves people, Pastor Barry Culberson. Tell me, if you don't mind, let's all stand here in the room one more time as we show respect for God's word in the name of Jesus. I tell you right now, we're blessed to have the Word of God. And the very fact that the devil hates it, does everything he can to get rid of it and tell lies about it, uh, uh, he's never been able to destroy this book. And he never will be because this is the Word of God. It doesn't contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. Satan wants you to believe all kinds of things about this book. 
but it is the Word of God. From 11 years old until now, I've been living my life with this book. And when I stick with a book, I have deliverance and healing and miracles in my life, prosperity and blessing as long as I go with the book. When I decide to take a detour, it's a different story. <laughs> and so we need to stay with the book. So let us pray over the Word of God today out of respect for the Word of God. Father, we praise you and thank you for your Word. We thank you, Lord, for sharing this with us. Many countries are not allowed to even have this. In many c countries where the Mar Marxists have taken over, they're not allowed to have it. And in some religions of other countries, refuse to allow the Bible to be present. We praise you that we have the Bible. We will never give it up. And we won't just let it collect dust on the bookshelf or on the coffee table. We're going to uh, meditate on your word, learn your word, speak your word, and uh, do your word as you enable us to do so. You said be, your word says be doers of the word. <clears throat> Bless your word today and anoint us to preach your word. And Father God, remove every distraction, anything <clears throat> that would keep us from hearing the word of God, move it out of the way. Especially those folks who are at home or in the car, wherever they are. And I pray, Lord, every distraction will be moved so they can actually hear the word of God in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> if we do not have self-giving love, the, Bible, the Greek word is agape love in us. The Bible says we have not, we have not passed from death to life. In other words, if I'm born again... The first thing you can see change in me is you see love and the fruit of the Spirit. What's the first one? What's the first word? Love, joy, peace, patience, love. So <clears throat> without love, everything we do, the Bible says, is in vain. There's a lot of Christians today that can't claim to be born again. Oh, I love Jesus, but they're mean as junkyard dogs. <laughs> they're mean to people. And it begs the question, are they really born again? 1 Corinthians 13, 1, If I can speak in the tongues of men and even of angels, but have not love, I'm only a noisy gong or a, a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all the secret truths and mysteries and possess all knowledge, and if I have Sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains, <clears throat> but have not love, I am nothing, a useless nobody, is the translation here in the Amplified Bible. Speaking in tongues, prophetic gifts, the word of wisdom, and the word of knowledge, the gift of faith, giving to the poor, and <clears throat> martyrdom is not a measure of true spirituality. Somebody say amen. amen. The true measure of spirituality is love. 1 Timothy 1.15, whereas the object and the purpose of our instruction and charge is love, which springs from a pure heart and a good, clear conscience and sincere, unfinished faith, whereas the object and purpose of our instruction and charge is love. The purpose of everything we teach and everything we do should be love. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How can we claim to be godly and not love people all? Capital A-L-L. -L, all people. Whereas the object and purpose of our instructions... Uh, instruction and charge is love. <clears throat> Everything we teach and do is, a, is to produce love out of a pure heart. 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed from death to life, life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That is strong language. Amen. Why is everybody so quiet? 
<laughs> I get very nervous when people get this quiet. Uh, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And it doesn't just mean family brother or even a brother in Christ. When Jesus told this story of the uh, Good Samaritan, the good neighbor, you see, he's talking about a total stranger. Total stranger. And yet he loved him and cared for him. And Jesus said, this is the way you're to live. We need to look at ourselves. Are we really living that way? If we're born again, we must. Whoever hates his brother, neighbor, stranger is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life about it in him. That is so strong, it's almost scary. <laughs> it makes me want to check up to be sure that I really love people the way I'm supposed to. 1 John 4, 7, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. A country boy was a bold-faced, bold premeditated liar. <laughs> if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. You know, the devil's always at work. He wants us to hate each other. And that's a real tool of his. And uh, uh, he, he, he's always stirring up things. And he uses people to stir up hate. And some even just flat tell lies. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. Anybody scared half to death yet? <laughs> this makes it very clear, if we hate anyone, we're not going to make it to heaven. No, today many people are whipping up hate between the races between the wealth and the poor, between Christians and non-Christians, this is what Marxists always do. A lot of the stuff you're seeing going on in America today, that's exactly what's going on. Their motive is not pure. Their motive is to create hate. They want the poor people hating the rich people, the hate rich people hating the poor people, black people hating the white people, and the Hispanic people hating both. <laughs> and the Asia hating everyone. Uh, and uh, that is a trick of the devil. It will destroy us individually and send us to hell. And it will certainly destroy a nation. Amen. Jesus said, love. There's a lot of talk about systemic racism and what's superiority and all of these different things. And sometimes you get so confused. I've even heard some key leaders in the black community even from decades back to say they don't even they're not even sure what systemic race, racism is it can't be defined nobody you know how can you repent of something when you can't define it but Jesus defined it and one word hate if you hate somebody for any reason you can forget heaven and I'm saying that to me you know my family too is a luxury we cannot afford. And especially hating somebody because of the color of their skin. And it goes both ways. Amen. Amen. And what sends a white person to hell will send a Hispanic person to hell or a black person to hell or <laughs> hate has to go. Today, many people are just whipping it up for ulterior motives. And there are, you know, there are some legitimate complaints out there. And there is real police, police abuse in some cases. And my family's experienced it. I've experienced it personally. And I'm white. <laughs> really olive, but they call me white. There's some real things. But there's no way, no room for hate. Always reject hate. And I want to address something here that I haven't told this story ever publicly. But uh, 
especially black and white people, we have got to love each other. And especially as Christians. They, we got to set an example for everybody that we can love each other, help each other, support each other, be a blessing to each other. <clears throat> and for some reason, I've loved black people my whole life. I mean, really genuine. I remember, and I can remember this. I couldn't have been more than about two, maybe three years old. Mom was downtown Rome, Georgia, during the day, uh, days of segregation. You know, this beautiful black lady was there in the store, and I saw her, and I ran to her. I put up my arms like this, and I can still see it. She reached down and grabbed me and picked me up and hugged me like this, and my mother just busted out in a big smile. And I remember that like it was yesterday. Where is room for hate? But there's people who will try to convince you that all white people are bad and try to convince you that all black people are bad. I'm here to tell you, all the black people I know are good. <laughs> and sin can wreck anybody's life. And there's blacks who are sinners and there's whites who are sinners and Hispanics who are sinners. And the remedy is Jesus Christ. If any man is born again, he's a new creation in Christ. And the first change you're going to see is love. Amen. Amen. There was a black woman and her two daughters and grandchildren that came to church here 25 years ago or so. And, uh, I mean, they became like family to me. One daughter was married, had a husband. The other did not, but uh, both of them had children. And so the daughter that had children, I mean, she spent a single she spent a lot of time talking to me and I was loving on her and trying to help her and advise her and I really fell in love with that family and her single daughter went to UT the one that I spent a lot of time counseling with a professor, a professor at UT taught his class that white people are racist they're all evil they use black people as pawns and just went on and on and she told me about this. She had even talked to me about it in the victory group in front of other people. And I tried to encourage her, wait a minute. I don't know. I honestly don't know anybody I consider to be a racist. There are some people that's not comfortable around black people. And there are some people that's not comfortable around white people because they're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing and it upset somebody. But that's not racism. That's just an overabundance of caution. The daughter, she told me about all this, and I tried to explain to her that, that this is just not true. They may be racist here and there, but uh, most people are not racist on either side. This professor spewed out hatred every day, and it's probably still there. There's hate being stirred up on all of our university campuses right now, and most of it is secular humanist devil professors who really are, are uh, Marxists. Many of them, about 25% of them admit to being Marxist. I love that family, and I spent a lot of time in their home. Had my victory group in their home many times. They left the Knoxville Christian Center, and I never did know exactly why. I couldn't find out. And later the mother told someone, we were just pawns to bury. I'm going to tell you right now, that broke my heart. I can hardly even, it's the reason I never talked about it. And, of course, I'm always afraid to say anything, afraid I upset somebody. <laughs> but that broke my heart. And it still does just thinking about it. That lying devil of a professor persuaded her that even somebody that had loved them was a racist. I spent my whole life working in the black community. I bust thousands of black kids when I was in my 20s all the projects in Louisville, Kentucky, I brought them to church. You talking about an integrated church, I integrated that church. You know? uh, and you know what? The white people never complained one time. I buzzed hundreds of black people to a youth camp that Dottie and I built. And they uh, uh, and paid for everything. I paid for their insurance, food, everything. And I had asked them, well, can you at least pay for the insurance? No, nope, don't have any money. 
And when we get to camp, we had a concession stand, and you could buy drinks. And these same kids that didn't have any money to pay for the insurance, they'd whip out $20 bills to buy, to buy Cokes and candy bars and all kind of stuff. And so, but I, I just kept paying for everything. And so, uh, that's been my life story. So for somebody to in, 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 to in any way imply I'm a racist, just, I mean, it just really breaks my heart. And folks, we cannot allow people to stir us up like that. Amen. Jesus didn't talk about systemic racism. He talked about hate. And you can see hate. Harry Telford has been one of my best friends for over 20 years. And I mean best friends. I've been in his house many times. He's been in my house many times. He's been my co-leader of my victory group for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And I have a tendency to call everybody boy. <laughs> Okay. just a good old country boy so everybody's a boy and so I found myself calling Harry boy and one day I said uh, Harry you do know I do not mean anything about by that I said I call everybody boy he said oh I know he said I can see I can tell when a person's motive is wrong if you're looking for love and hate you can tell if you're trying to figure out some systemic racism, you're never going to figure that out because nobody can even define it. But you can recognize uh, hate and love. Harry saw by my actions, I really, really loved him and cared about him. He uh, really, he does nearly all of our maintenance work here in the church right now, volunteer. He ain't paid. He has knee problems, back problems. All kind of problems, and he'll kind of climb a ladder, and nearly 30, these walls in here are 20 feet tall, and the outside is 30 feet tall because of the parapet walls. He gets scaffolding 20 feet high, this ceiling is 21 feet high, gets up and, and changes light, but does all kind of things. What do you call that? A godly friend. <laughs> a godly friend. Just think what I'd be missing if I was a racist. What would I be missing if I was a racist? Look at all the black friends I have. Alice, she play, every time I get in trouble, I call, Alice! And when she starts praying, I can feel it. She prays me out. And don't even mention Nancy Holmes. That woman, she had, she's been one of the few people that's really encouraged me. She still calls me on Father's Day, and like I'm her, <laughs> her father. And she just tells, oh, you're the most wonderful pastor in the world. I know it's not true, but she really believes it. And it just makes me feel so good. I needed somebody to encourage me last night, and I called her, and it went to voicemail. I didn't get her. <laughs> so these people walked away, walked away from people who love them over a hate monger. We must recognize when we're loved and not believe the devil's lies. Satan's behind all of this, ladies and gentlemen. Satan is the father of lies. Let's make up our mind. We're going to practice the love of Jesus Christ. Christ-like love. So let's focus on love uh, for a few minutes and just see what it is like. We need to be able to recognize true love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy. It is not boastful or vainglorious. does not display itself haughty, puffed up. Love is not envious, boastful, or haughty, and puffed up. You see, this is not just love between the races. I mean, this is love between family members. You know, that we cannot be... Uh, envious and jealous and boastful we must love each other uh, black people must love black people white people must love white people Asian people Hispanic people we all must love each other James 14 says humble yourselves therefore uh, be, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up you see if we'll humble ourselves and love all people God will exalt us I'm totally convinced that no one can hold a man of God or a woman of God down if they'll be obedient to the Word of God and live godly and love people the way they're supposed to love people. 
1 Corinthians 13, 5, love is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. I am very, very proud of being so very humble. <laughs> and that is called pride. <laughs> if it is, not, uh, it is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride, it is not rude, unmannerly, and does not act unbecomingly, love God's love in us does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. Have you ever seen some Christians? You look at them a certain way and they get their feelings hurt. Well, they don't like me. <laughs> this and love won't allow that. Love would just dismiss that and say, well, I don't know why they acted that way, but I'm going to love them anyway. But the devil will tell you, while well, the pastor, you, you notice how he ran by you this morning, didn't speak to you. Well, he doesn't like you. He's mad at you. You need to understand the devil's always at work. I was running across there because I had to catch somebody, had to get something done for the service, and I didn't have time to stop and shake everybody's hands. And now it takes a lot longer to shake people's hands because you've got to take that sanitizer and spray your hand and spray their hands. And then you've got to stay six feet apart. You know, if you've got two, three-foot arms, you're six feet apart. And so you've got to consider all that. So it takes a lot longer now to be friendly than it used to. For it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful, easily angered. It takes no account of the evil done to it, pays no attention to suffered wrong. Love is not rude, self-seeking, or touchy, not easily offended, always upset about something, and pays no attention to suffered wrong. Even when somebody does mistreat us, we forgive them and love them anyway. Instead of being self-seeking, we need to seek and support others. Philippians 2, 4, each of you should look not only to his own interest, but it's also to the interest of others. You can't be touchy and always upset about something and really care about the interest and the well-being of other people. you got to get yourself out of the way. Amen. You see, if we want God, God seeking our interest, we must seek the interest of others. God does for me what I do for you. Hello. When I serve you, God takes care of me. Some people... When they're good to other people, they expect those people to be good back. But I've found very often that is not true. <laughs> but God would send somebody else to be good to me. God's in charge of that. I remember in uh, high school, there was this kid there. He was poorer than I was. Uh, they had 12 kids. We only had eight. <laughs> but we were blessed. Didn't know it, but we worked. Uh, Daddy owned our own farm. Mama still lives there right now. I was down there a couple of weeks ago. That is still the most beautiful little farm. And I, and I just thank God I got to grow up on this farm. But we were dirt poor, at least I thought we were. But that farm was worth something. And Daddy uh, grew all the food we ate, and including beef and pork, and he provided it all. We, we'd go to the grocery store. We didn't buy hardly anything. <laughs> and uh, so we really had it made in the shade and didn't know it. But this kid, uh, I mean, he, they were really in poverty. And it was segregation, so there wasn't any black kids, it was white kids. And so uh, I loved on that kid, even when I wasn't really living for the Lord the way I should. It was just something in me to be good to people. And uh, my mom gave me a dime so I could get me a coat and a pack of crackers. And that tells you how old I am. I could get a pack of crackers out of the machine for a nickel and a Coke for a nickel. And now, they're, what, each a dollar and a half? <laughs> I mean, I go way back. But I, very often I give him one of my nickels, buy him a Coke, and Mama make me like two sandwiches, and I give him one of them. Not bragging on me, just to tell you, that uh, every time I was in a fight, he was on their side. He never sided with me, and I'm the guy feeding him. You don't do good to people because you expect something back. You love people just like they are. And you make no demands. 
And if they turn around and stab you in the back, you love them anyway. You try to get the knife away from them so they can't stab you again. <laughs> And being a pastor, I'm going to tell you, so many times I've been so disappointed. The people I poured the most love into and the most work into, the first ones to tell a lie on me. I pray for this guy. He was totally, he, I mean, he was really dying. I pray, and God healed him. And he went through the whole church telling lies on me. I'm just saying, love people. Amen. Just love people. Unconditionally. And God has sent somebody to love on you. He'll send you a Nancy Holmes. <laughs> yeah. They'll love on you and praise you and encourage you even more than you deserve. And somebody said, Amen. Amen. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Love is not this, the conceited. Uh, I've got so wound up here, I don't even know where I am. I'm still in the room, I think. <laughs> Philippians 2 4. Each of you should not should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. First Corinthians 13 6. It does not, love does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness. When you see people being mistreated, it doesn't matter who they are or what they are, it bothers you Amen. if you're saved. Right. You're born again. Rejoice when truth prevails. Look at that. It does not rejoice at injustice and, un and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Rejoices when truth wins out. Rejoices when evil is conquered. Uh, I love people, so it makes me angry when I see anyone mistreated. How about you? God wants and demands justice for everyone. Romans 12 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay self the Lord. If we give God time, he will bring about justice for all of us. You don't have to worry about getting even. God promised to do it for you, and God can do to people what would put you in jail. <laughs> Y'all believe the Bible? Anybody here believe the Bible? Now let's look at the true character of love. Love looks for the best in everyone and hopes for the best. Uh, very often I can just look at people and I can see talent and ability in them. I told someone a while ago, and I really mean it with all my heart, God has got great plans for you. The, the hand of God is on you. You may not see it, but you're special. And love looks for that in people and then helps them get there. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love endures long and is patient and kind. Love does not give up easily. Love does not get mad and leave the church just because things do not go its way. Love is patient and kind when others are rude and crude. 1 <laughs> Corinthians 13, 7, love bears up. Under, every, under anything and everything that comes is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Believe the best of every person. You don't just look at a person and start being suspicious. Are they a racist? Are they this? Are they that? You look for the best in every person, and if you find it, you praise God for it. And you might just find it more often than you think. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. Is every ready to believe the best of every person? Is hope its hopes? are fadeless under all circumstances and endures everything without weakening. Love bears up when it is mistreated. It is ready to believe the best and endures when people need us. We hang in there with them and don't give up on them. That's love. There is no greater example of Christ-like love than Dottie's story about the Good Samaritan. In Luke chapter 10, verse 25, And behold, a certain lawyer, she told the story, but I want to read the scripture so you can really get the word of God from scripture. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, 
What should I do to inherit eternal life? Notice what the question is. What do I need to do to have eternal life? And one of those two things is love your neighbor as yourself. And the Samaritan shows you how to love your neighbor as yourself. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And if you, of course, you must be born again. And once you're born again, then you start loving people out of a new heart. Verse 26, he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. There's a little different translation, but it's still the word of God. Uh, and your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Do this. Love God, love your neighbor, and you'll have eternal life. I don't know why so many people think they can be rude, crude, and mean to each other and expect to go to heaven. I mean, there's, a, there's hundreds of churches all over Knoxville, and a big percentage of them are there because they got mad at each other and split the church. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, so this, do this and you will live, verse 29. But he, wanting to justify him, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And I've wondered that myself at times. Who is my neighbor? But Jesus does not tell him who his neighbor is. Jesus tells him how to be a good neighbor. Amen. You kind of expect that from Jesus, don't you? And But you get from that who a good neighbor is, is someone who loves you and cares about you and tries to help you. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now this Jew is in big trouble. Now by chance a certain priest came by down the road. Here's this preacher. With his suit and tie and his limousine. limousine. <laughs> he just drives on by. I'm praying for you, brother. A certain, uh, now by chance a certain pre priest came d down the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite. When he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Love you, brother. Praying for you. You ever get that from people when you really need their help? Or do you do that to people when they really need your help? I'm praying for you. And, and of course, that's, I don't be belittle that. A lot of times, that's all we can do. We certainly need to be doing that. But sometimes we can hand somebody a $20 bill, too. Amen. But a certain Samaritan. As he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Now, you understand that the Jews hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans hated the Jews. Jesus is telling this modern-day story. Let's change the characters. Samaritan, a black man. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I'll repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, the lawyer said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. If you want to go to heaven, go and do likewise. Let's get the word out there, folks. People are playing with eternal souls with this hate thing. 
The lawyer asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus never told him who his neighbor was, but told him how to be a good neighbor. And, of course, you can see who your neighbor is. It's somebody that treats you like that. Jesus uses the Samaritan as an example of a good neighbor. John 4, 9 says, For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, and yet this Samaritan took care of this Jew. Jesus and Samaritans pretty much hated each other, as I've already said. Jesus knew their hatred. That is why he used a Samaritan to star as the star of his parable. To show that hate can never get in the way. We love each other, period. Today, Jesus would say a black man drove by and found a white man robbed and beat up and took him to a hospital and took care of him. And, of course, we can reverse that. A white man drove by and found a black man robbed and beaten up and took him to a hospital and took care of him. You see, the only way to defeat racism is with love. And the way, and the way you identify so-called racism is hatred. Like Harry said, you can see hatred. <laughs> Amen. But don't accuse people of racism unless you know they are racist. You can see it and you can learn it. It reveals itself. So let's don't be suspicious of each other and let people stir up hate among us. Because if we know what love is, we can recognize it. If we know what hate is, we can recognize it. You see, we need to be able to recognize love. John 4, 21, uh, and, he was, and he has given us this commandment. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Whoever loves God, say that with me. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Choose love, not hate. Not hate. Have nothing to do with people who are full of hate. Someone's always spewing hate. All oh, those sorry white people. All oh, those sorry black people. Don't have, don't have anything to do with those people. And pray they'll get saved. Amen. Philippians 1 9. And this is my prayer that, you lo that your love may abound more and more. Your love may abound more and more. Your love may abound more and more. Everyone in this room, let's stand. Father God, we thank you and praise you that you are God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If he lives in us, that love is going to leak out. It's going to be revealed. And if it's not in us, that hate's going to come out. And Father God, every one of us who's born again, we're going to resist the devil's lies. And we're not going to be sucked in. And we're not going to put anyone down. We're going to love everybody. If someone proves to be a racist, that's a different matter, black or white. But we're going to believe the best about every person. Amen. We're going to look for the best Amen. in every person. And we're going to allow Jesus Christ to shine through us.